Let's just go ahead and state the obvious. My name is not Lauren. Lauren is uh, suffering with Jesus with his family on vacation. My name is Brad Duncan, and uh, I'm, I'm one of that Acts 29 uh, church planter pastor friends of his, and I get the opportunity to step in this morning, and, and just a huge honor to, uh, to step in and walk us through the text this morning. I, just before we get there, man, thank you. The last uh, several months, my wife and I have had an opportunity to join you on, on uh, several Sunday mornings, and I, I just want you to know you've been so welcoming, so refreshing to us. You, like, introduce yourselves to us. You tell us your names. Sorry, don't remember them. All right, I'm trying, but uh, we'll get there, right? And, and, and just as we ferociously seek Jesus together, it's just been so encouraging and, and just sudden under the powerful teaching of God's word through your pastor and his leadership, like what a gift this church has in the pastor of, of, of Lauren and Shepherd and leading this church. And so just thank you so much for encouraging my, my heart, my wife's heart and, and our kids' hearts. It's just been really beautiful. Um, speaking of refreshing, last week after church, uh, Lauren and I, we hopped on a plane and we went to Las Vegas to do some fundraising. And um, not really. Um, we went down there for, <laughs> some of you are like, really? You can do that? Yeah, you just have to tie 20%, okay? So uh, it's stupid. Don't get me started. Okay, um, so we went down there. We we're part of an Acts 29 cohort. So it's, it's a group of pastors that we get together. And, and what we do is we really encourage one another. We'll bring resources to one another. Hey, here's something that's really helped me, and we share resources. At the same time, we also come together and we share difficulties and hardships that we're working through. And we ask for them to kind of, other brothers to kind of help us and, and, and navigate through that. And so um, uh, Lauren and I have been doing this cohort for about six, seven years. He's actually risen to the top, and he's leading the cohort now. He's leading other pastors around our region. And I just want to I just want to thank you for sharing your pastor. The truth is, I'm a better man. Man, and I'm about. I'm gonna start crying. I gotta think of my happy spot, which is my Harley. Okay, I'm gonna start crying. Um, uh, just, I, I'm so grateful for your pastor and, and his voice into my life. I'm a better man. I'm a better pastor because of him. And, and listen, TFAB, your influence uh, regionally and globally, it goes beyond what you're aware of and just by your sharing and your influence in that. And so uh, thank you so much for sharing him. And thanks for uh, the invitation to be, be here this morning. Honored. This morning, we're going to do this. We're going to continue on in our journey through the gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, and as we're turning there, let's just do this. Let's open up the floor for a little bit of discussion this morning, okay? I want you to think about some of your greatest memories. What are some of your greatest memories? Would you just share some of your greatest memories? Just maybe maybe a short sentence or a phrase. Greatest memories. Go. Yell it out. Somebody. Birth of a child. Birth of a child. Nailed it. Excellent. Greatest memories. Keep going. Marriage, Marriage your wife. Excellent. What's your wife have to say about that? Just joking. That's stupid. Like, you guys are getting me started already this morning, right? <laughs> what else? What do you got? What's the, moving to Bend. I love it. And then somebody said something back here. Boston. Who were in the Boston? Can you raise your hand? Are you kidding me? Way to go. Nailed it. I'll watch you from my lazy boy. That's great. That's wonderful. What else? Greatest memories. Huh? Day you were saved. Loved it. Like, how can we miss that one, right? Come on, anybody else? Greatest memories? Children's, Children's baptism right over here. What? Six to nine feet at Oak. I don't know what that means, but it sounds awesome. Jill, right? You know what that means. Jill? Is it Jill? Okay, excellent. Very cool. All right, let's change gears. What are you looking forward to the most in life? What are you looking forward to the most in life? Yell it out. What are you looking forward to? God's plan. Thank you. Like Jesus, by the way, come on. Jesus is a safe answer in church, right? Like we can just throw that one out right out of the gate. Jesus, okay, we're good with Jesus. Okay, what else are we looking forward to in life? Huh? What else? A lot of life, absolutely. Huh? I'm a little deaf from rock and roll, okay? Anything else? What are you looking forward to? Vacation, thank you so much. Vacation. Anything else? Lunch. Lunch, excellent. <laughs> Man after my own heart right there. I love it. What are we eating? Very good. Well, the text today is going to do this. The text is going to call us to do two things. The text is going to call us to look back 
to God's faithfulness in our lives. At the same time, the text today is going to invite us to look forward to God's promises and the great anticipation that we can have of God fulfilling his promises in our hearts and our lives. This morning, we're in Luke chapter 22. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning for the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading uh, verse 1 through verse 23. And here's what I'm going to do afterwards, okay? After we read it, I'm going to pray and then, and then we're going to open up the floor for discussion again. We're going to do observations. So as we read through it, is there a certain word or a certain phrase or a concept that just pops off the page? Take note of that. We want you to share about that in just a minute. Here we go. Luke chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve, and went away and conferred with a chief priest and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money, so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to, uh, to to betray him to them in the absence of the crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you've entered into a city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Verse 14, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, The cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man go for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to question one another. Which of them could it be who is going to do this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we just want to pause and we just we just want to say thank you. Thank you. We just want to bless you, God. Thank you for being such a good God passionate, caring, merciful, patient God, but not not a distant God, but actually God, you describe yourself as our Father, our spiritual Father, the perfect Father, full of relationship, full of hope. And thank you, God, that you've got plans, big plans for us, and that you've not hidden those from us. You give us promises about what you're up to and what you will accomplish. And in this, God, you've given us your word, and we thank you for your word. We ask this morning, God, that your word would speak to us in truth and purity. God, would you give us understanding of this text that we just read? There's a lot there, God. We need to hear from you. God, this morning, would you cause the soil of our hearts to be the good soil? May your word be planted in our hearts, and would it grow and bear fruit? Would you get glory out of that? Now, God, personally, I just pray for so much grace for me right now, God. I need your grace. Would you be with my mind? Would you be with my heart? And would you be with my mouth, Father? Would you be seen? Would you be heard? And Brad, fade away, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You can have a seat. All right, there's a lot there. Let's open up the floor, okay? Observations. As I read that text, what are maybe some phrases or concepts that popped off the page to you, okay? What'd you see? Just yell it out. Verse 10, what's verse 10 say? Yes, okay. So if you're listening online, it's, it's the portion of the jar of water and, and God's preparing somebody. To, she, she said, God's, what's your name? 
Bonnie, thank you for sharing, Bonnie. Uh, God oftentimes prepares us to do something with even out, without even saying a word she shared. Excellent. Is there another word or phrase or concept that you saw in there that popped off the page to you? Betrayal. Yeah, we're going to talk about that this morning. I think a lot of us can identify with that. Let's just tell the truth. What else? Bread. Bread. Yeah, we're going to talk about the, we got communion, right? We're going to talk about what, what Jesus is doing as is, is the Passover feast is starting. He's instituting communion. So we'll discuss that this morning. Great observation. Anything else? His ability to do what? Be the Alpha and Omega. Great insight. Love it. What else you got? Twelve. Yeah, the disciples are all gathered there. Excellent. Okay, let's jump in. Let's talk about a little bit of context, because to understand what's going on right here fully, we have to unpack its context. Much of the context has to do with the timing of what's going on right now. The timing is crucial. There's a major event that is taking place right now. It's the event of what? Of unleavened bread or Passover. It's a feast. It's a festival. In a minute, I'm going to unpack that. It's one of three primary festivals or feasts where the Jewish community was, was invited to come together and to celebrate it together. You had Pentecost, you had the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths, because during this one, everybody would go out in the streets and kind of camp out in the streets the whole time. It's kind of fun. I like to do that one. Also, you had this one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, okay? And so during these festivals, Jews from all over the country, they would travel to Jerusalem, specifically during this one, to do two things. What are we going to do? We're going to remember. We're going to look back at our story. We're going to remember our past. We're going to see the hand of God, and we're going to give him honor for that. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to look to the future where we're going to remember the promises of God. And what was his promise? He's going to send a Messiah. So we're going to be watchful for the Messiah to come. Okay? Now, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover. I think I'll just refer to it as Passover this morning just, just so we can just remove some of the confusion, okay? Now, does anybody remember the origins of Passover? Anybody remember that? Somebody share with me what the origins of Passover were or was? From Exodus, absolutely. What happened in Exodus? Wonderful. Excellent. You're on it. Nailed it, Okay. So here's what happened. In Exodus, remember, the children of Israel, they're God's chosen people. However, at this time, they were living in bondage in Egypt as slaves, not living as free people. After 400 years, God says what? Hey, children, I see you. You've forgotten who I am. I'm going to reintroduce myself to you. I'm going to lead you to freedom. In fact, I'm going to take you to a land flown with milk and honey. In fact, it's actually going to be the best property in the entire world. I'm going to do that. I'm going to lead you to freedom. So you remember the story. Moses goes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, absolutely not. And what follows is a series of plagues. You remember that some of these plagues are just like jacked up, like gnats and frogs and all that type of stuff, Right. And so, so God's sending these plagues. In this, he's doing two things. He's, 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 he's breaking the will of Pharaoh. That's the subtle thing. The big thing he's doing is he's reintroducing himself to the children of Israel. I am Yahweh. I am powerful. Okay? Does anybody remember the very last plague that God sends? What is it? Yes, yeah, the angel of death, murdering of the firstborn. And by the way, don't just put a period there. You're on it, buddy. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just the firstborn of, of, of mankind. It's also the firstborn of livestock too, right? And so God says, okay, Pharaoh, you're not going to let the people go. Here's what's going to happen. The angel of death is going to pass over and is going to kill all the firstborn, okay? But with this, there's a promise, okay? There's a, a promise of hope and deliverance. How could someone survive the death plague? How could you survive it? Why aren't you preaching this morning, right? I don't know, uh, I don't know either. You and I are going to be best friends. We're going to get you up here, right? So, 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 so here's what God said. Okay, children of Israel, children, here's what we're going to do to survive. Take a, an unblemished lamb. We're going to slaughter it. And we're going to take its blood and we're going to put it on the doorpost. So when the, when the angel of death flies over, it'll see that and it will pass over the house and you will be spared, right? In addition, that night, the children of Israel, they were also instructed to eat something very specific. It was unleavened bread. In other words, it was bread that didn't have any yeast in it. Does anybody know what yeast often is a symbol of in Scripture? 
Why didn't you answer that? You've been on everything else, man. I know you're sharing the love. Way to go. Absolutely. It's sin. Because think about this. Sin, okay, something little small puffs up, right? And so they're supposed to eat this unleavened bread, okay? Now, I want you to pause and put the pieces together, okay? Currently, we're entering into this festival, and in this festival, they're supposed to look back at the faithfulness of God and see what God has done. By, what, by the way, isn't that a good discipline for you and I, too? Like, time out, how often do you just pause and just remember God's faithfulness in your life? Like, it's easy to pause and remember, like, all that jacked up stuff that we've experienced in life, but where's God? Like, why, why aren't we pondering Him? Why aren't we thinking about Him, what He has done? how he's delivered us, how he's been faithful, how he showed up in the darkest of moments. And by the way, we forget this one, how he parties with us in our wins. And why does he party with us in our wins? Because he's the source of our wins, right? So with remembrance, what happens is we grow in humility. And by the way, back to the text, the children of Israel, how were they saved? It wasn't by just being a good slave. It wasn't somehow just trying to honoring God as they, were, as they were working for Pharaoh. At this time, they'd kind of forgotten who Yahweh was. How were they saved? It was through the compassion of Yahweh. It was through his activity. It was through the sacrificial atoning death of a lamb and its blood being applied to their home. That's how they were saved. So the call of the children of God was to come together once a year and to remember the story. But it doesn't end there. They were also called to do something else is what? To look to the future with great hope. To remember, here it is, God's given them a promise. God's given a promise. And here's the deal. With God, a promise made is a promise kept, okay? So why don't we just, just camp out on that one for a while? Why don't we just think about that one for a while? Why don't we just meditate on that one for a while? Why don't we let that just transform the way we think and we view life? The promise was for a coming Messiah who would finally and completely redeem, restore, and rescue God's children to himself. So the call during this Passover, remember, okay? Remember the past, grow in humility and faith. Remember the promise, look to the future for the coming Messiah, okay? Now, again, time out. To truly understand what's happening, let's do this. Now, let's zoom out from chapter 22, and let's go back to the entire book of Luke, okay? What's Jesus been doing for 22 chapters? What's he been doing? Well, he's been traveling around all over the country. He's been teaching. He's been preaching. He's been binding the wounds of the brokenhearted. He's been performing miracles. The deaf hear, the blind see, lepers are cleansed, the possessed are freed, and the list goes on. Now put the pieces together, okay? Because of the Passover, remember this call for everyone to come together, this means, put this together, this is awesome, okay? This means that many that were present at the Sermon of the Mount were now what? were now gathered in Jerusalem. This means that some that may have seen the man with the withered hand that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, some of them may have been present now in Jerusalem. Family members that experienced loved ones die and Jesus bring them back to life, like the centurion and a servant, like the widow and her son. What about Lazarus? Many of these family members more than likely were now present in Jerusalem. Homes of the outcasts that Jesus would have entered into and shared a meal. Many of them would have been present. What about, what about those people who sat around and they saw Jesus pray over some fish and some bread and the disciples like distribute and they just like chowed down in the countryside? Many of them now would have been present in Jerusalem. You getting a picture? At the same time, possibly some of those who caught this woman during the festival of booths in the very act of adultery and brought her to Jesus, would have been present. Those that would have criticized Jesus for eating with sinners would have been present. Those that would have criticized Jesus' disciples for not honoring the Sabbath, or even Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, would have been present. Many that questioned Jesus, that tested Jesus, come on, that were envious and jealous of Jesus. Those that would have blasphemed against Jesus, saying, hey, you cast out demons because you are the prince of demons. They would have been present. And why were they all there? Well, we've already said it a number of times. They're called to look back, God's faithfulness, and look forward to a coming Messiah. Listen, everything, everything we're talking about, everything within Scripture is pointing to 
It's leading up to and it's longing for Passover, for Passover, okay? So Passover is not only the backdrop for the text today, it's the filter that we're gonna look at the text through, okay? It's the reason they were gathering. It was the reason for troubles. And it's the reason, listen, Passover is the reason that a lamb had to be sacrificed, okay? All right, first six verses, what do we see? We see opposition. Uh, oh, that's chapter 23. It's gonna preach completely different. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared people. By the way, it doesn't say they feared God, does it? It's scary stuff right there, right? They fear people more than they fear God. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad, of course, and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the crowd because they're afraid of the people. Okay? Okay. Passover. Passover is looking ahead to a Messiah, right? And it's really clear that the, these, these chief priests and these scribes, as they look forward to a Messiah and they see Jesus, they're saying, not him. He's not the Messiah, right? And so, so what do we see is we see in verse six, this, this clear picture of opposition. This opposition is gonna start a little bit broad, but man, Luke's gonna start naming names, right? And there's, if you're reading this for the first time, man, there's a plot twist right here, isn't there? And there's an old foe that we haven't seen in a long time suddenly show up as well, okay? The first two groups of people, they're chief priests and scribes. The chief priests and the scribes were two, two of three groups that made up the Sanhedrin. Some of you are saying like, okay, what's the Sanhedrin? Let's just put the cookies on the bottom shelf this morning and let's just call them the Supreme Court. It's kind of who they were in the day. They were the Supreme Court of the day. They were political in nature and they were also religious in nature. But the problem is they used their religion to control people and to make themselves look better, okay? And, and, and other than the power of Rome, listen, they, they kind of ruled the land. You know, history would tell us that the Sanhedrin actually had the ability to put kings on trials. By the way, read in between the lines. What's the Sanhedrin want to do? They actually want to put the king of kings on trial right now. And next we see the opposition. We see this. Opposition often comes in the most surprising places. Have you experienced that in your life? Dude, I didn't see that coming. Judas. Judas. One of the hand-picked disciples of Jesus one that had been taught directly from Jesus, like what we wouldn't give for that, right? He traveled with Jesus. He had a front row view of Jesus' teachings. He saw with his own eyes, what? The, the deaf healed and, and the blind see and the lame walk. He saw the dead rise. He, he was one of the dudes that carried a basket with the fish and the bread. Are you kidding me? This guy, he saw Jesus walking on the water. He saw Jesus with his own mouth speak to creation in itself, and creation tapped out and submitted to Jesus. And when Jesus says, mellow out, peace be still to the storm. He saw Jesus casting out demons. And now this Judas is named in opposition to Jesus in partnership with the prince of demons, Satan himself. Okay, now point of clarification, I'm not gonna camp out on this that long this morning, okay? But I personally don't believe what Luke is saying right here when he uses the phrase, then Satan entered into Judas. I don't, I don't believe that means then suddenly Judas was possessed by Satan, okay? If you look at Luke's writing, if you look at the original um, text, the original language, if you compare Luke's writing here to when he writes Acts, there's some similar, I think what Luke's saying here is he's influenced, Okay? In fact, let's look at one example. You go into Acts, and in Acts, what's, there's something beautiful that's happening in the church in Acts. In Acts, suddenly this, this generosity wells up within the church, and they, they want to further the mission of God. They want to plant more churches, right? They want to give widows and orphans. So what do they start doing? They start selling all their property. Remember this part? And they're bringing all the, prop, all the money together, and they're giving it. And at one point, there's this dude and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember the story? And they sell their land, right? And they're like, we want in on that. They sell their land. They come to Peter, and Peter says, is that really what you sold it for? Because they had held some money back, hadn't they? 
Ananias says, yeah, that's what we sold it, lied. And here's how Luke records this. He says, Peter says to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? It's a picture of Ananias being influenced by Satan, okay? So we're not going to spend a lot of time there. I just want you to, listen, if you want to talk more about that offline, I love coffee. Let's just get together. I'll let you buy, okay? Just throwing that out. Stupid Brad, just preach the word, okay? Um, uh, so anyway, there's a lot we could say about Judas. We could talk about his love for money over his love for people, okay? But here's the main point I want to get to. Listen to me. This is going to ring home with you, okay? Listen to me. Judas the man that Jesus had handpicked to walk through life with him, not only walks away from Jesus, but joins in opposition against him. So, so the friendship that Jesus offers Judas, the brotherhood that Jesus offers Judas, listen, is now weaponized against Jesus himself. Are you kidding me? And then lastly, we see an old foe named. And although he's been flying under the radar, he's been pretty busy. And that foe's named Satan. We last saw, last saw Satan in chapter four, but we haven't seen him since. He's been busy. We've seen his influence, okay? Chapter four, what do we see is we see a face-to-face -face opposition with Jesus and Satan. Satan shows up, tempts Jesus, says, Jesus, you've been out here in the wilderness for 40 days. Like, you gotta be hungry. There's some, see those stones? I bet you could just turn them into bread, right? Jesus, listen, you want power? Huh? Do this. Worship me, and I'll just give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Hey, Jesus, let's test God. Just jump off the temple. I bet you don't even hit the ground. The angels are going to swoop in and save you. And what's Jesus do? Each time he just quotes scripture, boom, 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 doesn't take the bait. And here's how that conversation wraps up. The text says this, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, here it is, until an opportune time. Until, now, put the pieces together. We haven't heard from Satan, right, since, since chapter four. We're in chapter 22 now, right? He's been busy, but we're now given insight into the thoughts and the motivations of Satan right now. He thinks now is the opportune time, right? So again, what are we seeing in the first six verses? Opposition. Opposition. And so, time out. I just care for our hearts for a moment. I want to be so loving to you right now by just telling you the truth. If you're a son or daughter of God, let me tell you the truth of what you can experience in life. You can experience opposition. That's what you can experience. It's consistent with Scripture. It just, I mean, from cover to cover in Scripture, that's what we see. Sons and daughters of God, there's opposition. It just spills off the page. I mean, look at the beginning. Adam and Eve, opposition. Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Daniel, David, Samson, Noah, Nehemiah, Ruth, Esther, Stephen, Paul, Peter. And listen, I'm just getting us started, right? They all face opposition because to be named a child of God is to be named as an enemy of Satan, demons, and this broken culture that we live in and its values. Here's the truth. Opposition comes. Opposition will find you. For some of you, when you get home, opposition is going to be waiting at your doorstep for you. For others, it's already found you. And within Scripture, we see two kinds of opposition. There's a spiritual opposition that we all face at times. And then at times, there's this, this general opposition. It's the effect of just simply living in a broken world. And here's what I want you to know. There's nothing that we see already within the text that's going on that we don't already experience in our own lives. Let me show you. Listen. Listen. If you've ever been falsely accused by an authority figure, if you've ever been falsely accused by an authority figure, I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna ask you to do something right now. Would you have the courage just to simply stand up? If you've ever been falsely accused by an authority figure, have the courage to stand up right now. Thanks. Have you ever had anyone talk about you behind your back in an attempt to discredit you and your reputation? Ever had that happen? Would you have the courage to stand up right now? Somebody talking about you behind you, but some of you standing already, you're like, dude, can I throw up an arm with that one too? Right? Yeah. Listen, have you ever invited somebody 
to walk through life with you? You offered them your friendship only to later have them weaponize that friendship against you? If you've ever experienced that, would you have the courage to just stand up right now? Thank you. Yeah. Now just throw in the effects of living in a broken world. <laughs> have you ever been seriously sick or had disease? <laughs> right? Yeah, you can sit down. Some of you are like, I'm supposed to stand, stand. I kind of like standing. Can I join you up? Can I join you up on stage, right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you ever, have you ever been seriously sick or had disease? Right? Have you ever lost a loved one? I mean, listen, if there's any comfort in this, as we looked around and saw people standing, here's the comfort. You are not alone. You are not alone in this room. Some of you should have been standing, but you're just too afraid, right? That's, that's okay. I don't know if I would have in a strange place. Maybe you're here for the first time. But listen, you're not alone, and not only are you not alone in this room, listen, from page, from cover to cover through Scripture, you're not alone. Other people experience the same thing. Others know the same pain, fear, and frustration. And here it is. Here's the promise that we see from cover to cover in Scripture. God uses opposition for His glory and for your benefit. That's what we see. He's not surprised by it. He's not intimidated by it. He's not threatened by it. And so this morning, the invitation for you and I is to just simply tell the truth. You know, biblically what we are? Broken people living in a broken world in need of a great God. And there's great freedom in just telling the truth in that. And in that, as we just tell that to God, here's the truth, we begin to experience the collision of the divine and mankind of God coming and stepping into our lives. Okay, I got to keep going. All right, backdrops Passover. Within this, so far, we see opposition. Now, here's a call to prepare, verse 7 through 16. Then came the day of, un oh, yep, then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said, Behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jaw of water, here you go, will meet you, follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where's the guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room furnished to prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. Okay, in the most simplest of terms, what has Jesus been preparing for his entire life? Most simplest terms, what's he been preparing for? Yeah, you nailed it. His death. He's been preparing for this. Listen, chapter nine, okay? In chapter nine, Jesus realized what's gonna happen in Jerusalem. In chapter nine, he sets his face towards Jerusalem. Everything that's happened since chapter 9, we're in 22 now, he set his face towards Jerusalem. He's preparing for his death. What's he doing along the way? Man, he's preaching with new boldness. He's being so blunt. He's healing people along the way. At the same time, he's being blunt saying, hey, hey disciples, here's what's going to happen. They're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise on the third day, right? Now, he gets to Jerusalem. He's prepared. And I want you to know it's emotional. On the outside of Jerusalem, he just sees the walls and he begins weeping over the brokenness of Jerusalem. And then he goes inside, he goes to the temple, he sees what's happening in the temple and he goes medieval and just starts throwing over tables. It's emotional. And at one point he says, oh listen, it's on. You're gonna take me out, I'll be back in three days. And in the midst of all this preparation, Jesus pulls together his disciples and says, listen, I've been so looking forward to sharing this meal with you. I am, I am prepared. Now it's your turn to get prepared. By the way, preparation for the Passover meal was extensive, okay? Uh, there, was, there was the day of sacrifice and, and, and Passover in, in the midst of the festival of unleavened bread, and, and preparation for this, it, it pretty much took all day. Early in the morning, what would happen was uh, hundreds of priests would get together and they would go to the temple and they would burn leaven that had been ceremonially collected throughout the night. And then roughly at three o'clock in the afternoon, here's what happened. All these pilgrims with their animals to be sacrificed, they'd line up in two rows and they would enter into the temple where they'd be met with priests. And these priests would have either uh, gold or silver basins. 
and the pilgrim would slaughter the animal, and the blood would be poured onto the, into the basins. And that blood would be taken to the altar and would be thrown on the altar. And the slaughtered animal, its carcass would be put on one shoulder, um, it, its skin on it, uh, on the other shoulder, and, and the pilgrim would leave. And meanwhile, in Jesus' time, the celebration added elements beyond the Old Testament prescriptions. There was a Seder meal. Some of you may have heard of this. It's a time where they, they got together in, small, in the homes and they shared a meal, and there was an actual program to it. They all would dress in white. And they, would, they would sit and they would recline at these, these tables called a triclinium. Basically, what it would have been is, is these small, tiny little tables. In some sense, instances, it would have been couches, but short little tables that would have been kind of in a horseshoe. And they would recline. Why would they recline? Because they were no longer slaves in Egypt. They could recline. They would eat bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitterness of their slavery when they were in Egypt. They would eat this kind of mushed up soup of fruit and vegetables that was made to kind of look and remind them of the paste that they used to, used to make the bricks with for Pharaoh. And they would eat the roasted lamb, remembering the blood that had to be applied to the doorsteps to save them. And so if you go back to the text, listen, Jesus was fully prepared for the Passover. And now he turns to Peter and John and says, you go and you prepare the Passover for us. Go into the city. You're going to find this dude with some water. Just follow him, all right? And when he gets to the, his house, talk to his master. Say, hey, we need the room, all right? And they go and they find the master. And here's what verse 13 says. It says they went and found it just as he had told him. And they prepared the, the Passover, Jesus was prepared. He invited his disciples to get prepared. And listen, by extension, he calls you and I, listen, get prepared and stay prepared. Get prepared and stay prepared. Now, what does that practically and tangibly look like in our lives, okay? Listen, if Passover was looking back and looking forward, then the question for you and I becomes, listen, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? In fact, maybe we should just ask you this, like, what's on your table? What's on your table? You know, earlier I mentioned the fact that we are all broken people living in a broken world in need of a great God, and here's the problem with living in a broken world. Our broken world has an amazing marketing department. They do. Through technology, it, it taps my emotions, and it sidetracks me from what? From what? From learning from my past, from hoping to my future, to instead just being self-absorbed in the present. That's the problem. It gives me faulty promises that to experience earthly joy right now, I need to invest my time, I need to invest my energy, I need to invest my money, my resource into the now. So I need to own this and I'll experience joy or visit there and I'll experience joy. And in some cases, even give this and you'll experience joy. How's all this affect us? Often our lives just get cluttered with a lot of stuff. I mean, it's some good stuff, but it's stuff nonetheless. Let me ask you a question. What's on your table? Maybe you're an artsy person. This right here, this is a, a 2002 uh, Gibson Les Paul Deluxe. Uh, I lived for 12 years in Nashville. Uh, it was part of the music scene. Um, my, my main gig was with this uh, little Australian girl named Rebecca St. James. And I was her lead guitar player and musical director. Uh, it's kind of a family affair. Some of you are familiar with um, for King and Country. That's her little brothers. So um, we go with this guitar. Gibson used to give me guitars. This guitar, I went to the plant and said, I want that wood. All right. These pickups, I got to wind the pickups with them. They taught me how to, they're special pickups. This guitar has been around the world. Actually down here, it caught on fire in Norway. It's a great story. Coffee, you're buying. I'll tell you the story. Okay. You know what? This, this guitar right here, it's, it's a really good guitar. It's a good guitar. God looks at Adam in the garden after he had made him. He said, Adam, here's the problem. Dude, you ain't going to make it on your own. Oh, I forgot to plug this in. You ain't going to make it on your own. I had a digital picture here. Bummer. I don't know if it'll pop up in time. You ain't going to make it on your own. No, we're all good. Well, anyway, 
So what's he do? Said, dude, take a nap. <laughs> Adam wakes up, says, whoa, man, right? You gonna make it, you need some help. <laughs> and he gives him a woman. God's the giver of relationship, of love. And there's nothing like in life the beauty of being in love and giving love and receiving love. I got some pictures up here. I shared last time that I got to, to uh, teach here that, that my wife in the back, hi, Heather, will you wave? There, there she is. <laughs> hi, Chloe. Chloe's here and Ian and Marshall. Um, we eloped on Thanksgiving Day this last year, and we got married in, in Hawaii, on the beach in Hawaii. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing story of redemption and restoration in both of our lives. Amazing. <laughs> And I, I, I look at these pictures and I just weep. You know what? This day in Hawaii, this story, it's, you know what it is? <laughs> it's a really, really good story. It's a good story. In the fourth grade, I had to buy a jacket for school. And uh, maybe you're into sports, by the way. I had to buy a jacket for school and I went over and I, and I just picked out this NFL jacket. It was a Rams jacket. Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. Since the fourth grade, I've been a Rams fan. This Super Bowl, that was a good day right there, right? For, I'm like, I've been through a lot. Maybe you're really into sports, and sports takes up a lot of your time. Maybe that's it. Maybe you're into the outdoors, right? A year ago, as a gift, my son and I, we were given two season passes to Bachelor, right? And we live in Albany. And so every week, like we were here opening day, every weekend, often in, in, in the midst of, of the week, we're blitzing out of here. I'm like, son, just do your homework ahead of time, right? I'll do it on the drive, and he's sleeping, right? Like we killed, there's nothing, like we, we were there opening day, and we closed the mountain down too. We were there on closing day. And we've often talked, and, and you know what we have? We got some really good memories, good memories of hitting Bachelor together, <laughs> Go back to Genesis. In Genesis, God says, Adam, not only am I going to give you a woman to love, I'm going to give you a work to do. Maybe you're focused with work and your job and getting ahead and, and, and climbing the ladder. Yeah, it's a ladder. It's, I mean, it's a small table, right? So just go with me here, okay? I know when you preach, you'll have a better ladder, okay? <laughs> just climbing the corporate ladder. Maybe that's it. You're just consumed with just get, you know what? You know what you want? You want to live the good life. That's what you want. You're consumed with work. Maybe that's what's on your table. Maybe you just love reading. All right? So getting lost in books and they take you somewhere. You experience something or you learn something. And you know, at the end of the day for you, maybe there's nothing like getting caught up in a good book. A good book. Speaking of books, there's an author, his name is Jim Collins. Jim Collins, he wrote a business book. Some of you might be familiar with it. Even though it's a business book, there's a biblical principle to it. The book is called Good to Great. And here's what he says. Good is the enemy of great. So many times in our life, we settle for the good and we never experience the great. What's on your table? What's consuming your time? What's taking up your energy? Is it the good things? Because the truth about this is the good things in time, they just really just become idols of self-interest. The great life is a Passover rich life. A life that takes time to ponder the price that Jesus paid to redeem and to adopt you as the son and daughter of God. A life that's living with a great hope. Now listen, we all, in our culture, we all have hope. Well, I hope my team wins. I, I hope that I get that job contract. I hope that I fall in love. I hope that my children don't struggle. I hope for more snow. I hope for more sun. Listen, I hope, that, I hope there's no cops out while I'm driving to church today, running a little late. We're all familiar with the concept of hope, but that's not living with the great hope. Living with a great hope is seeing with clarity your past, the blackness of your sin, the hopelessness of your plight, and the scarlet red blood of Jesus applied to your life. 
The beauty of now being clothed in his righteousness. That's living with hope right there. Living with a hope right now is, is, is leaning forward into and through life, into eternity. So it's, it's so in tune with the weight and the draw of eternity that that filters everything that I do in life. It's pulling me through. So here it is. The truth, yes. In this world, we suffer rejection sometimes from our best friend. But we look at life through the promise of Passover, a Messiah that has come and will return, and we're reminded of a Messiah that hasn't rejected us. Yes, the truth is this. In this life, it's lonely at times. But we look at life through the promise of Passover to a Messiah that has come and will return. And meanwhile, this Messiah is not a distant God to be served. What? He's a friend closer than a brother. Yes, it's true. The truth is this. In this world, we, we struggle with the lure of original sin that's jacking with my mind, messing with my heart, constantly pulling me away from God. And sometimes I take the bait. But I look at life through the promise of a Passover to a Messiah that has come and will return and what he has clothed me now in his righteousness. And yes, the truth is this. In life, I'm engaged and you're engaged in day in, day out spiritual battle for our souls. But we look at life through the promise of Passover to a Messiah that's come and will return. The same Messiah that did this, he spoke the universe into existence, and then later on, on the cross, that same voice cried out, it is finished. What's sealing the doom of our enemy and what? The victory for our souls. And yes, it is true. Yes, it is true that there's sickness and disease and death in this, this, this life, but we look at this life through the promise of Passover to a Messiah that has come and will return. He was dead. He was buried. What? And three days later, he became what? The firstborn of the dead, giving you and I the promise that we can follow after him, that death no longer will rule and reign over you. That's living with a hope. You getting a picture? Preach that one next time. That's a good one. Knowing all the implications of Passover, Jesus was prepared. And he calls you and I to get prepared. That Messiah is coming back. Are you prepared? How are you preparing for what you've yet to experience? Lastly, the table. When the hour had come, he reclined at a table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread when he'd given thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant, my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on this table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Again, take a moment and enter into the text. Use your imagination. Who are these who are these men with Jesus sitting around this table? Who were they? We know we had a bunch of fishermen. We know we had a tax collector, some zealot who was both politically and religiously a zealot. Some were loud, some were impulsive, some were really, really quick to speak. You got a pair of brothers that Jesus gave a nickname Sons of Thunder to. That's awesome. Probably because, you know, maybe they were a little bit impulsive themselves. Maybe they were easily angered especially when anybody came at Jesus. You got one guy who's always bragging that he was the one that Jesus loved the most. One guy, he's, he, he's always bragging he's the fastest runner. We'll get to that one when we get to the resurrection. Some just seem kind of quiet. It's kind of blended in like we really don't know much about them other than their name. 
And we know one who has always struggled with believing. And because of that, what do we call him? Doubting Thomas. This was the original Motley crew. <laughs> they were such mis misfits, weren't they? And here's one of the mysteries of the gospel is this strange attraction that Jesus had and has for the unattractive, the strange desire for the undesirable, and the strange desire for the unlovely. And what was, by the way, what's Jesus doing this whole time? You know what Jesus is doing? He's just doing just what he's seen the Father do, right? Man, loving people, doing this, and loving whom the Father has given him, the elect. In this, the invitation is now extended to us to come as children to a loving father. A child really shouldn't have to struggle to get in good position with a loving father, right? Shouldn't have like, if I'm on my best behavior, my room's clean, will you love me now? Right? I, I, I took my dishes to the kitchen, will you love me now? Huh? If, 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 I, if I'm really good, can I eat dinner now? You know what my son does? My son's 15. He comes home, he has this night, he's just naive enough to know who he is and who I am. He just walks up to the table and says, sits down and says, what's for dinner? All right? And I say, Dad, can I please sit down at the table and join you? And this is the invitation of the gospel, to be children and just know who you are and know the invitation to come and sit with the Father. And it's at the table in the text that Jesus speaks of the price that he would have to pay to adopt us as children into the family of God. Look at verse 19. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The unleavened bread, which according to the Seder was equated to what? The bread of affliction now takes on an entire new meaning when Jesus saying this bread of affliction will represent my body. My body will be afflicted for you. I will be stripped naked. My, my beard will be ripped out. I will be beaten and whipped beyond belief. His body was pinned to a cross, a cross and thrown in the ground. What? Out of love for you. Verse 20, we see the cup. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. By calling the cup the new covenant in my blood, Jesus was intentionally tr contrasting his atoning work, the shedding of his blood, with the ocean of blood that we see in the Old Testament. In Exodus, we understand that within the Old Testament, sacrifices of animals to make atonement for sin, everything, listen to me, everything significant had to be doused with blood. So when an animal was sacrificed, they would take half of that blood and they would throw it on the altar. Another quarter of that blood and they would throw it on that individual. Another quarter of that blood and they would throw it on the scroll. Listen, it, it was brutal and it was messy. Everything significant was doused with blood. It was bloody. It was an ocean of blood. It's not a pretty sight. But it was done this way for two reasons. Number one, to emphasize the seriousness of sin. And number two, to teach that the payment for sin is death. But the weakness of the Old Testament covenant was that it was dependent upon our ability to keep the law. And you look at the Old Testament and you see all these people like they come together and, and they're chanting together in one voice. They're saying this, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will obey. Yeah, right. Did they? No. Do you? No. Do I? No. That's the weakness of it. Now we move to the new covenant. No longer is it dependent upon my ability to, to keep a promise. It's completely dependent upon Jesus. He does it all. Our salvation rests solely on the infinite ocean of his divine blood that has been poured out 
for you and for me. So what? How do we apply this now to our lives? I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And let's begin doing this. Let's pause just for a minute and, and let's process. And I know that this morning you were drinking from a fire hose. Like that's a lot of content there. And I, I'm just starting, I'm just like, I'm loaded for bear. I'm just getting started. But on that, like how, how do we apply this to our lives? I think it starts with celebrating Passover. Don't you? I think that's where it starts taking some time to look back to God's faithfulness in your life and asking some really, really important questions. Like, God, where did you show up? What specifically did you do? God, remind me what you said to me. God, remind me how you provided for me. Like, how did all that affect me? Let's take some time just to go back and to remember, to just stop, just stop. Stop what we're doing and remember. As we remember and experience the byproduct of what? Growing joy and growing peace and growing faith in our life and who our God is. I think the second thing that we need to do today and to start a habit out of is lifting up our eyes to our great hope. Reminding ourselves of this biblical principle. This world is not our home. This world's not my hope. Start living with the expectation of a Messiah who's come and who will return. He's promised to return. And with God, a promise made is a promise kept. So let faith and hope cause you to lean into and through this life, as the elect child of God, living with all the glories of eternity, here it is, just right around the corner. That's what we're looking at. All the glories of heaven just right around the corner. Let's start living for that. And this morning also, we're going to do, um, well, we're just going to obey Jesus. Jesus says, hey, listen, this is how I want to be remembered. Uh, when you come together, um, take the bread and take the juice in remembrance of me. Take the bread of affliction, symbolizing Jesus' body that was given for you. Take the cup of the new covenant, symbolizing Jesus' purifying blood poured out for you. Listen, do this to come humbly to the table. Oh my God, you love me despite what I have done. You purified me despite what I thought, how I've acted. We come to the table humbly and we leave joyfully confident of the promised future awaiting us right around the corner. We're going to worship now in a diversity of ways. We're going to respond not by singing songs, by expressing worship to God through song. We'll worship God by partaking in communion, and there's communion available at several stations around the room. And so just as you're ready and as the Spirit of the Lord moves upon your heart, you're free to partake. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of Passover. Thank you for your passion for us. Teach us the discipline, Father, of remembering Ah, your faithfulness. As we remember, I pray that faith and hope and humility would grow in our lives. And also, Father, would you do this? Would you give us a glimpse of what's right around the corner? Would you remind us of your promise? That the Messiah will return and with you a promise made is a promise kept. We love you, Father. Increase our love for you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.